Um, good morning and um, thank you for letting us present the results of the OPAL trial on behalf of the OPAL team. This was a trial funded by the NIHR, which is the Department of Health in the UK, and I have nothing to disclose. So the OPAL trial assessed whether EMG biofeedback assisted PFMT is more effective and cost effective than PFMT alone in treating women who had mixed or stress urinary incontinence. This was a multi-centre randomised controlled trial which compared biofeedback PFMT with PFMT alone. And the women in the trial were randomly assigned to these two groups by rem remote computer allocation and we minimised this by the type of urinary incontinence they had, the severity of the, the incontinence, their age and the centre in which they were being treated. We also did a mixed um, methods process evaluation and a longitudinal qualitative study alongside the main trial which helped explain the trial results and those results were presented yesterday. So the trial interventions, both groups received pelvic floor muscle training in their intervention group and the PFMT consisted of six one-to-one -one appointments with a specialist physio or nurse over a period of 16 weeks. In addition, in the biofeedback group, the women had EMG biofeedback used within their clinic appointments with their therapist, and they were also given a handheld biofeedback machine to use at home while they exercised between appointments. The therapists who provided the intervention followed a theory-based protocol, and they tailored that protocol according to the individual women's circumstances and needs. They progressed the exercises in terms of the repetitions, the hold of the duration, sorry, the duration of the hold, and the positions that the women exercised in. And they were aiming for the women to do three sets of exercises a day. In both of the arms incorporated into the intervention were behaviour change techniques, and these would be examples of these would be the technique of commitment, where both the woman and the therapist would agree um, between them the exercise programme to be undertaken and would sign a contract. The women we included were 18 years or older and they were newly presenting with stress or mixed urinary incontinence. We excluded those who'd had recent experience of having pelvic floor muscle training, those who couldn't contract their pelvic floor muscles. If they, had, um, if they were pregnant or had a delivery in the last six months or if they had a prolapse of stage two or greater. Our primary outcome measure was the ICIQ, urinary incontinence short form at 24 months with higher scores representing more severity. Secondary outcome measures include, included questionnaires relating to other types of pelvic floor symptoms. Also, we measured quality of life, women's self-efficacy for pelvic floor muscle exercises, their impression of their improvement, adherence to exercise, any treatment, further treatment uptake for um, urinary incontinence, and also pelvic floor muscle assessment. We used the EQ5D, to calculate the incremental cost per quality adjusted life year, and that was the main part of our economic evaluation. We collected the data via uh, participant completed questionnaires. The women completed these at baseline 6, 12 and 24 months after randomisation. The women also completed exercise and biofeedback diaries as appropriate in between appointments. The therapists completed a record of each appointment that took place between themselves and the woman and a blinded assessment of their pelvic floor muscle um, function was undertaken at six months and the therapist completed the Oxford scale and the ICS um, assessment methods. So over 30 months, we randomised 600 women across 23 centres in Scotland and England. And these were a mix of community settings and hospital clinic settings. In terms of demographics, the women in the trial were aged average age of 48 years, and as you can see, the majority had mixed urinary incontinence. The groups were well balanced in terms of their other demographic, demographic factors, so their BMI, for example, and the number of uh, births that they had had. And when we looked at the number of appointments attended, they were, they were well balanced there also. Um, in both groups, the women attended an average of four out of the possible six appointments with their therapist. So on to the results. This is the results of the primary outcome analysis. So we did an intention to treat analysis and we used linear mixed models with the models adjusting for the baseline severity and the minimization variables. We found no significant difference in the ICIQ urinary incontinence short form at 24 months. As you can see, 
The mean um, ICIQ short, short form score in the biofeedback group was 8.2 compared to 8.5 in the um, PFMT alone group and this uh, resulted in an adjusted mean difference of close to zero. In the table you can see that we also found a pattern of no difference between the groups at the earlier time points of 6 and 12 months. And the diagram shows you the improve improvement in both groups which was sustained across the um, duration of the trial. In terms of women's impressions of how they had improved, we found no significant difference between the groups in the PGII at 24 months, with the proportions saying they were very much better or much better being similar between the groups. Again, you see the same pattern at 6 months and 12 months of no difference between groups. We asked women about their adherence to pelvic floor exercises, and as you can see, at 24 months, we found that similar proportions in both groups were exercising at least once a week. We found similar patterns of exercise adherence at the 6 and 12 months also. Women attended at 6 months to have their pelvic floor muscles assessed, and this was by a therapist who had not been involved in their treatment so was blinded to their group allocation. We found no difference in the Oxford score between the two groups. And we also found no difference when we looked at the, the results of the ICS method, either in terms of the contraction strength or the degree of relaxation in the muscles. When we looked at 24 months about uptake of um, further tre treatment for UI, there were similar proportions who had had, had surgery by this time point. And you can see that this pattern was ob observed also at the earlier time frames. Similarly, when we looked at other term, uh, types of, of non-surgical treatment for UI, we found no difference between the groups. In terms of cost effectiveness, biofeedback PFMT was not significantly more expensive than PFMT alone, but neither did it generate any more quality adjusted life years. So this resulted in the incremental cost effectiveness ratio of £56,000, which when um, compared to the nice uh, recommended thresholds of 20 to £30,000 for cost effectiveness would mean that the probability of biofeedback pelvic floor muscle training um, it was less than 50% probability of being cost effective. So in conclusion, we found consistently no evidence of a benefit of adding BFM, PFMT, to, sorry, biofeedback to PFMT at two years in this trial. And um, we would conclude that there's unlikely to be a clinical benefit or a cost effectiveness benefit in routinely adding biofeedback for women with stress or mixed urinary incontinence. Pelvic floor muscle training is the cornerstone of conservative management of urinary incontinence and we should continue to investigate ways to intensify and maximise the benefits of pelvic floor muscle training. Thank you. We can now welcome questions. Hi. Hi. Thank you. I'm Petra Form from the Netherlands. Thank you for a very nice presentation. I was wondering, there were a lot of uh, uh, participating centra in this study, mm -hmm. did they? Did you use uh, a standardized treatment protocol for all pelvic floor physiotherapists? Yes. So the the trial team um, developed a clinical intervention manual, and we visited each centre, and we had a day of training where we standardised the um, the intervention the staff who were delivering the intervention in terms of what they would deliver in each arm, including the use of the biofeedback machines. Okay. And so you did a, a kind of Delphi round to, uh, to, um, uh, to standardize the, the, the treatment protocol with amongst uh, all, the pelvic, all, the, all the people who treated the patients. Um, maybe you mean... Um, in the development stage, we, we did um, develop the intervention, including the women's health physiotherapists, in, in agreeing that the elements of the, of the pelvic floor muscle intervention. Is that what you mean? Yes. There was a process where, where that okay. was developed initially, and then when that was finalised, that was what was used in the training of the different centres across okay. the, yes. the trial. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Hi. Thanks, Susan. Uh, very interesting. Uh, two questions. First question is, how was the a pelvic floor muscle training alone, what what exactly did you do? Everybody knows uh, EMG biofeedback, how it's performed, but what did you do in the in the other session or in the other arm for therapy? Okay, 
So um, we based we based the intervention on the intervention we'd used in other trials where um, the um, we were aiming for the women. We, we obviously the women were assessed at baseline to see what their ability was, mm -hmm. and we were aiming for them to progress towards doing three sets of exercise a day. Um, we included um, both uh, um, long, sorry, fast and long hold contractions, and we would be aiming for them to do ten long mm -hmm. holds with ten seconds rest, then followed mm -hmm. by ten fast contractions, and to do those in sets over the day. Yeah, Is that what you mean? Was was the how was it the pelvic floor muscle? So the pelvic floor muscle therapy or training alone was it assessed with digital palpation? Was there any feedback to the patient? Uh, yes, so the the women would the women would be have a vaginal examination um, every time. That was that was agreed between the women and the therapist, but that yeah that was offered at each appointment. But it, it depended if the woman was okay, menstruating so you, or the you, woman. You didn't. actually gave uh, they were, they aud digital. auditive feedback about the contraction yes. to the okay. So yeah. you compared auditive feedback versus visual feedback. No, no, <laughs> no. 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 All yeah. women received. One training instructions on how to do pelvic floor muscle training mm -hmm. as they would in any in intervention. Yep. In the UK, we don't use, we routinely use EMG biofeedback, so mm -hmm. the physios especially were used to treating. So when the patient would come back, it would be more of a discussion how, how are you doing? If they were quite happy that they were doing the exercises correctly, they did not have an individ another individual pelvic floor assessment digitally. Ah, okay. Okay. So okay. they weren't having digital okay. biofeedback at each Not standardized. No, okay. No, so no. then, and, and my follow-up question, because... Um, we do have data on that, actually, is, about whether yeah, women were examined. It, I see a lot of studies where uh, patients who are unable to contract their pelvic floor are mm -hmm. excluded. And I yeah. think that's, especially that group, will benefit more from visual feedback than the group who can. Absolutely. So that's, I think that's a, a pity, actually. Well, it's... Um, Would be an interesting... Study. Yeah, no, uh, the guidelines in the UK um, say that those are the, the group of women who we should use should biofeedback benefit. with. So, and this was a, a, a study funded by the, the Department of Health in the UK. So, um, we we had to exclude the women who couldn't contract. It wouldn't be ethical to in include those women because they would be the women who would um, benefit from yeah. The right. so can I, can I also okay. intervene just to say that quite often, if women can't contract their pelvic floor muscle training. Some would then want to use electrical stimulation, yeah. and we excluded that as an adjunct. Okay, so when yeah. that couldn't no, contract, we understand. Thank you. Any other question? I wonder if you uh, plan to do a sub analysis to see if there is uh, any difference in women with weaker pelvic floor or yeah. other. We did. Baseline. We did do. We had planned subgroup analysis of both the um, type of urinary incontinence and the severity of urinary incontinence. We didn't find any um, statistical difference there, um, but the, the study wasn't powered to do, um, you, know, you know, to find those kind of differences. The the effect size looked to be slightly better in the women who had the milder symptoms and those who had stress. Okay. Um, but as I say, we don't want to draw any firm conclusions from there. Can I ask a question as yeah. well? Because I think the meta-analysis and the systematic reviews have constantly found the same as mm -hmm. you find here. Mm -hmm. uh, since you are a statistician, you could probably explain uh, what's the difference. Uh, why do we need this study when we have the meta-analysis? Why do we sorry? need this one? I think this is an ex excellent study. This, mm -hmm. But we have had meta-analysis before. Yeah, saying the same that it's not uh, different. <laughs> she was answering. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I didn't quite get the question. Um, one of the things about the um, existing systematic review is that the um, summary estimate of effect has a very wide confidence interval, so we don't have a very precise estimate of the effect. And so, and the NIHR um, as a funder wanted to know if this form of making the pelvic floor muscle training more intensive was cost effective, because if it was, it was worth doing in ordinary practice, and what this trial fairly convincingly shows, uh, with a very tight uh, confidence and a very precise estimate of effect, that it yeah. doesn't add the benefit. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.